Today, we will be talking about the latest updates about the vaccines that are in progress for SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. So let us start our discussion. Before that, I want to touch on a couple of things that are very interesting as well. Number one, I heard from someone, and this question has been uh, uh, raised again and again. Uh, one of that was that, do we have the the second wave started? So in that discussion, somebody talked with me today and saying that, hey, I've heard that Wuhan has a second wave that is starting. So look, in the absence of vaccination, in the absence of people becoming immune to this virus, there is always going to be a chance for those people who are still not infected and recovered to catch the disease so or to catch the infection. So of course, the most important thing is to have prevention. So I would suspect that Wuhan, Hubei province is a big province. There are 26 million people that live there. And um, if the reported numbers, if we believe in those numbers, the reported numbers are somewhere about 45 or 49,000 from uh, Wuhan area. And out of them, then a few thousand died. So there is there are, there are millions of more people that are in that area. And it is possible that they are going to get those infections either by the visitors coming in, or maybe there is contaminated uh, medical equipment, maybe not. So I'm not trying to ding anyone, but it is possible that those who are healthy can still catch the infection. So the right answer for the, uh, when would we stop the risk is when we have vaccine. Of course, there is another answer and that is when the herd immunity would develop, that is when we would also be protected. But um, moving towards herd immunity with 60% or two thirds of the population becoming ill is a very dangerous uh, possibility. So this is what one um, concept I wanted to make sure that we talk about, and that is the second wave uh, appearing in Wuhan. The second thing I have in my notes here, the second thing that is very interesting as well is that I heard from one more person and that is that virologists are kind of confused and surprised and kind of uh, scratching their head that this is a virus that has such a large uh, pro portfolio of uh, symptoms. So it started with the upper respiratory, then the lower respiratory, then it is, then we found out that it can cause GIT issues as well. Then we found out it can cause hypercoagulability as well. Then we found out that they can be Kawasaki disease as well. Then we found out that it can cause anosmia. So um, then the COVID dose came into the uh, picture as well. So on, on almost daily basis, there are new sets of issues that we see related to this pathogen. And uh, I don't think that virologists are that much confused about it. They are virologists, they are experts. In my opinion, the basic problem is actually very simple to see. So let me share my screen. Look, we know that this virus uses ACE2, correct? The SARS-CoV, the virus that was in 2002 time frame. That also uses ACE2. MERS uses a different receptor. It doesn't use uh, ACE2. I think it, is, it uses DPP4 or something. So ACE2 is used by SARS-CoV-2 as well. And it is this, this uh, receptor. The receptor is present in blood vessels. We, we have talked about it in our past discussions many, many times. So I don't think it warrants more discussion here, but just review that this ACE enzyme is present in the blood vessels. It is present in the epithelium of the um, tracheal or the respiratory system. It is present in our pharynx. So this enzyme is present here as well. It is present in the cardiac tissue as well, even the heart muscle. So it is present there too. Then we know that it is present in the GIT as well. So wherever ACE2 is present, that is where, where the infection can be. So if you look at all these diseases, respiratory, 
upper respiratory tract, cardiac, hypercoagulability, uh, the GIT symptoms, all of them has have one common problem, and that is the ACE2 receptors are present, even the renal issues. Renal issues actually occur because of two problems. One, when the infection becomes severe, that causes the heart, that causes blood vessels to dilate and the blood pressure to drop, heart not to work correctly. So the septic shock occurs. So the kidney perfusion reduces and that causes an issue. Plus kidney also has the ACE2. Remember that the largest quantity of the ACE2 receptors or enzymes are present in kidney and GIT. Then are the respiratory system and the heart then brain and other tissues. So kidney has an abundance of ACE2 receptors in it as well. That means kidney can become directly attacked too if the virus can reach there. So if you look at all of these symptoms, the underlying problem for these symptoms is ACE2 receptor presence. And we have done this discussion many times that when the ACE2 receptor is activated or used by the virus, then there is a pro-inflammatory um, uh, behavior because of angiotensin 2 and so on. So I'm not going there, but I wanted to make sure that at least us can see over here, we all can see over here, that even when it seems like we have multiple kinds of issues, hypercoagulability, upper respiratory tract infection, lower respiratory tract infections, pneumonia, and even pneumonia, man, this is such an interesting virus. Pneumonia, it starts with atypical, then it becomes typical, then it moves to ARDS, then it becomes septic shock, then it causes death. What are varied symptoms? Then heart failure, hypercoagulability, GIT issues, and renal issues. Then COVID toes, uh, strokes in the brain, they're all actually linked to ACE2, Raynaud phenomena. So they're all linked to ACE2. So please keep that in mind. So back here, uh, I wanted to discuss these. So second wave in Wuhan, we just touched, touched about that. Virologists. Then uh, one more thing, my country of origin. So of course, I'm, um, I'm an American citizen at this time, but originally I'm from Pakistan. And I heard today that Pakistan is lifting the, um, the lockdown or easing the lo lockdown. So a couple of things that I liked and a couple of things that I didn't like, I wanted to share with you. What I liked was that the institutes are not opened. Institutes, institutes are not opened. So that I think is a very important thing. I had been sending notes as well to the prime minister to say, please do not open the institutes yet, schools yet, because number one, it is very painful to have a child go through misery or death. And the second thing is that children can be asymptomatic. And I have shared many, many studies about that. And the asymptomatic children may themselves be OK, but then they can bring in that infection and infect others. So they can become the super spreaders. So the good news is that Pakistan did not open the uh, institutes. They're going to re reconsider a review, I think, on after 16th May. No, not 16th May, July, July. So that is a good thing that I liked. Uh, the What I didn't like was that people have started crowding the markets and the, the transport is opening up and those kind of things are happening. So that's what I did not like because that is going to cause a surge. And I was looking at Pakistan surge and in the last two days, there are uh, much more cases. So of course, uh, I don't think that people are wearing masks as well. I feel that when the society opens back up, Masks should be an important part of that. Prophylaxis should be an important part as well. So this is one part that I didn't like. And then another thing that I liked was, which was a surprise for me, a pleasant sur surprise. And that was, if anyone has coronavirus symptoms or a coronavirus test, agencies are very vigilant in tracking them bringing them for quarantine if needed and supporting them to to an extent that people are scared that if i cough somebody is going to come and uh, appear and work with me so that is a very different 
Pakistan compared to what I had seen. So that is a good thing as well. So uh, summary for Pakistan's easing of the lockdown, the cases are increasing. I think they're going to start increasing more because the lockdown is not going to be taken care of correctly, the, uh, the freedom. And then there are some good things that are happening as well in terms of institutes. So that is that. Now the next discussion. I wanted to talk about today the latest updates on the uh, vaccines. So before we can talk about the vaccines, it is important for us to understand the clinical trials and what phase one, two, three, or phase zero, one, two, three, four mean. So that when we talk about a vaccine and we say, hey, this vaccine is in phase one, we can understand what does that mean. So first of all, clinical trials, uh, these are usually for new drugs or combinations of drugs. So maybe there is a drug combination. Both drugs are actually not new, but we're going to start using them together. So there is a trial needed to see if that combination can be fine, can work or not. Then new use for existing drugs. For example, nowadays with, uh, with pandemic, every day there is a new use uh, offer by a drug. I can give you an example. For example, hydroxychloroquine. I actually believe in hydroxychloroquine. So hydroxychloroquine's effect or ivermectin. Although YouTube took down my ivermectin discussion, so don't tell them that I talked about ivermectin in here as well. Uh, but ivermectin is a drug where they said that, all right, this is a drug for worms, but here we see that in human cells or in cell cultures, it was able to kill the virus uh, efficiently within 48 hours. So then they said, hey, why not we try to use this drug? So that is a new use for an existing drug. Hydroxychloroquine is a new use for an existing drug. Uh, remdesivir, which was for Ebola, is a new use of that existing drug for COVID-19. So there is this, uh, <laughs> Charles Kimani, thank you very much. He's saying that you're still my medical guru. Thank you very much. Um, we just studied together. Uh, and then medical devices. So there are many ways, many reasons for the medic clinical trials. And let's look at the phases of the trial. I write those things down beforehand so that I can be efficient with the time. So starting from here, so let's say if you and I, so we all here, we decide that we are the scientists and we are going to make a, a drug. So uh, 313, so you had put that comment as well yesterday that I, when I say adult, that is something that you like. So here I am. So I do have an accent. I, I'm fine with that. And uh, maybe I say many words that sound funny. So it turns out that I say adult in a way that that also sounds funny. So I didn't know that. Okay, back here. So when the clinical trials are going to happen, the very first thing is the preclinical research. What happens in that is that human cells are cultured. So these are the culture. This is the culture of a, a human cell. So they're all singing and playing and they have their own culture here. And we put the drug there and see the toxicity of the drug to the cells. Of course, we do not want to approve a drug that right away starts killing the human cells. So the very first preclinical stage of a drug uh, approval process is the um, checking in the, in the human culture, uh, not in the humans, but in, in the culture medium to see if the drug is safe. Then is the, the phase zero. Phase zero, as is here, phase zero is normally lesser than 15 people. Correct. So Jennifer said in vitro. Correct. So this is in vitro. Very good. Thank you, Jennifer. So this is in vitro. Then phase zero is in vivo. That means inside the human beings. So now normally a smaller number of people because we still do not know if the drug is going to be good or not. Smaller number of people and they're given very tiny doses. So they're not given the, the doses that can start doing something. And they're, they're healthy people. They're not sick. We give them the dose in a very tiny amount to see if the medicine would cause any issues. So what we are doing in this phase is we are looking for safety check of the drug. So these, this is done on healthy people, lesser than 15 people. Then phase one, again, healthy people, usually 20 to 80. And here, <laughs> excuse me, here we try to see that what is the highest tolerable dose. 
so they they are healthy people they do not have any comorbidities they do not have any underlying disease they are given the dose incrementally in, we increase it to see what is the upper limit the highest dose that can be given without causing any negative uh, symptoms so again dose check and the safety check the third thing that is done in phase 1 is the route of administration is it better to give orally or is it better to inject uh, is it intramuscular intravenous so the routes of administration are another uh, thing that are tested acoustic theory welcome uh, you had last time asked me this question that is there any moderator so if you are okay uh, you uh, join us every day as well uh, would you like to be a moderator so that we can um, have someone look at you know erroneous folks who appear every once in a while so medico that is probably not a good strategy for one thing after a week most of it, okay so acoustic theory is talking with someone no the virus or the mask will not act as a vaccine no virus will not absolutely virus will not act as a vaccine that is not that's not a good idea so thank you acoustic theory all right so back here phase 1 20 to 80 people what do we check in that highest tolerable dose safety check route of administration then is the phase 2 according to fda 70% of the drugs move from phase 1 to phase 2 in the phase 2 there are now patients instead of healthy individuals now we are working with patients and we take hundreds of patients of course in case of vaccination you cannot take a person who was already sick with covid-19 and say now i'm going to vaccinate you because they would have already developed the antibodies they do not need the vaccine at least for some months if not years so um, this is the case where drug can be given to a patient who is ill for example cardiovascular disease or hypertension or diabetes and so on in case of vaccine you will not take patients to cause the uh, to give them so you would just increase the number of people but they would still be healthy and known not infected people you give them the same dose which you figured out in in phase 1 but we just give it to patients and a larger number of patients and see what happens thank you very much dark king peter king says i can moderate as well so thank you very much peter so i would love if a few people can uh, moderate and uh, we can then start from there so can you please put a comment so after this video is done the normal comments if you can just put a comment in there i would pick up those who would like to moderate with me and we can then go from there okay back to the discussion so there's a question doctor what do you mean by viruses don't make good vaccines that's been a paradigm since smallpox no i didn't say that what i'm saying is that um phase 2 normally has patients on which you try drugs but if i am a patient of covid 19 and i have recovered or i am let's say in last stage of covid 19 giving me vaccine may not be necessary because my own immune system is already making antibodies against it against it my immune system has always actually already fighting the, with the virus so giving our immune system a hint to say hey be ready for this virus immune system is already fighting with it so what i'm saying is that for vaccinations phase 2 do not need to be the patients no worries no worries so here see the phase 2 is usually patients so anyways patients hundreds of patients and then dose same although in case of vaccination you may not need to have patients unless you had a patient for example flu flu you get people who become a patient of flu who get flu and then next year they can get flu again because the strain is different and you can try a vaccine on them so according to fda from phase 2 to phase 3 33% of the drugs move into that phase and what happens in phase 3 is that there are more than 3000 equal or more than 3000 uh, people who are now their patients again 
their patients and we start working with those patients. Dose is the same as we found out in the phase one. But drug comparisons to existing drugs may start. So for example, let's say there are four or five uh, uh, vaccines that get approved at the end. Now, any new vaccine will have to compete with them to see if that vaccine, the new vaccine is better than the old one or not. Same is the truth for, let's say there is a new hypertension uh, drug for hypertension. So there would have to be some sort of a comparison to see if the existing drugs are better or this new drug is better. And the better could be better control, better compliance, better dosage, better route of administration, better um, uh, less side effects and so on. Normally, phase three is done with a double blind study. So double blind study is a study in which neither the doctor, the one who is prescribing the drug, nor the patient who is receiving the drug know that they are giving a placebo or the, or the actual drug, or if the patient is receiving a placebo or an actual drug. So this is what is called a double blind. So normally phase three contains a double blind uh, study. Then after this, we get the FDA approval. <coughs> and this can take years. These things can take years. And then finally, there is FDA approval. And then after the FDA approval is done, the drug goes out for sale. But during this time as well, there is a continuous monitoring of the drug and collection of the data to see the long-term effect of the drug. So that is called the phase four. So the phase four continues. There is more, for example, nowadays there is a message about Zentac that it may be carcinogenic. So there are there are um, long-term discussions to see that long-term safety, efficacy, and other measures are correct. Is the drug suicidal in the long term? Does it cause other comorbidities in the long term and so on? So that data is continued to be collected even when the drug is being sold. So these are absolutely Surab. So double blind randomization and placebo is very good. Uh, Kevin, what are your thoughts about skipping animal models that FDA allow for the first time in history of vaccine? I so so in this case, I actually like that there is a Chinese company we'll talk about who actually went to uh, rhesus monkeys first. They they tested it there, and then they are now going towards humans. So I thought that testing it on a rhesus monkey or uh, other animal may not be very difficult to do. At least some, I mean, if you're going to skip it altogether, why not just try it for, for a week or so? But um, Kevin, to your point, there are there there is a risk. Every day people ask me that when will the uh, lockdown be lifted? When can we go back out? And gosh, we can lift the lockdown today, but we are all sitting ducks. We go out. If we don't have herd immunity or vaccination, we are stuck. So maybe there needs to be something accelerated. So even within the humans, the safety and efficacy can be tested. So Kevin, my short answer is that it looks like we need to do this. Um, I hope that we do it in a moral way, humane way, and ethical way without harming people. And there are volunteers who are saying that, hey, I wanted to help. So I understand there is a harm, but I am raising my hand to participate. I actually am willing to participate as well uh, to, to do that. So not an issue. Okay. So with that clinical study, so now we are clear, I hope, on the clinical studies or trial phases. Now let's look at some of the vaccines that are kind of ahead of the pack. And you're welcome, Kevin. The, these are ahead of the pack for a couple of reasons. For example, here you would see this, uh, this company, Chinese company, Sinovac, and this Oxford here, they are already ahead of the pack because they were already working on vaccines for SARS, COV, that is 2002 time, and MERS, 2012 time. So because they were already working on those vaccines, they already had a, a foot in the door. They were already running on that path. So they just very quickly turned um, towards this new virus and started making vaccine for it. So they had an advantage. Oxford study, Oxford vaccine is in phase one. So phase one, as you can see from here, 
20 to 80 people, highest dose tolerance, safety check, route of administration, etc. So they are in the phase one. The drug name is this CHAD OX1 and COV19. They are making it with Jenner. So Jenner and Oxford is doing it. The vaccine, I have done the vaccine strategies in the past. So just very quickly, this vaccine is actually made up of weakened chimpanzee adenovirus. So what they're doing is they're going to a chimpanzee, they're taking their adenovirus because it would not harm a human being. A virus, uh, yes, we, we are right now in a pandemic where a virus jumped from bat to an intermediate to humans. So when I'm saying this, it is kind of ironic that it, it is difficult for a virus to jump from an animal to humans. Normally, it has to mutate a lot to become adapted to work with human cells. So chimpanzee adenovirus is taken, plus SARS-CoV-2 spike protein gene is taken. So what they do is they are manufacturing a virus. So here is the adenovirus. In this adenovirus, they are sticking the coronavirus's gene that makes spike protein. They're taking that gene and putting it in here and then letting this virus go into our body as a vaccine. And of course, I'm sure that it is weakened. That means it is broken chemically in many, many areas. So it cannot actually cause damage to us. It is kind of a dead virus. But it is coming in with enough material in it that it can enter our, our body. It may be able to go into a cell, may be able to go and get presented to our immune system. And that alerts our immune system that, hey, there are the S proteins here because this gene, when that gets injected into our body, it's going to produce lots of S proteins. So it is like injecting the gene for some human being, which only makes a finger or a nail of a human being in another person. So that gene is only making spike proteins of the coronavirus, not the whole virus. So when those spike proteins are formed, our macrophages are going to say, hmm, I see something foreign here. So this is the macrophage. He becomes all uh, interested in that thing and picks up those spike proteins. And then the remaining immune system, I've discussed it many, many times, that it presents those to T cells. Then T cells would become T helper 2. That would cause the B cells to become activated. B cells would become memory cells for future. Plus, they would start generating Im immunoglobulins. And that is how the body's uh, protection mechanism will kick in. Just remember, it takes about 10 days, 7 to 10 days to do this. So it is not possible that today you get the vaccine and tomorrow you're fine. Your immune system would still need 7 to 10 days to process this whole thing and become ready. Once it is ready, those B cells would then be available for a longer period of time. And if the virus, actual virus with those spike proteins on it comes into, you know, dancing and kicking comes into our body, our immune system would immediately react and kill it. So that is the um, that is the vaccine that Oxford is making. So great, they're in phase one. The and we talked about it that why why were they able to make it fast? The second interesting um, vaccine is being made in Massachusetts here by I think um, Mass General. So it is Moderna. It is also in phase one. This is an interesting one. This is a novel vaccine. They are making a messenger RNA vaccine. So what they're doing is, so James is saying, all the influenza vaccines are used yearly, especially in elderly. It seems that they have lower efficacy due to the many mutations. Absolutely correct. And, and James, that is the concern that if the virus continues to mutate, then we have a problem. Although coronaviruses mutate lesser than influenza virus, at least the traditional coronaviruses we know. This virus is doing so many odd things that who knows, it starts mutating that way as well. I have been looking at nextstrain.org. There are many mutations, but the spike protein gene is still stable. And I think I know why it is stable. This virus cannot work with us or infect us without the spike protein. So if it mutates and creates another version that doesn't have the spike protein, then it cannot infect other cells and that mutated version would just die. So that is like the survival of the fittest. So it has to keep the spike protein intact 
so that it can work with us. And that gives us an opportunity to create vaccines against the spike protein to neutralize it. So I am actually very positive that and confident that the vaccine against spike protein will work without any issues. And if it if the virus loses the spike protein just in general by mutation, then gone. It is gone. And if it does not, then we will have vaccines. So this uh, Moderna, what they have done is they've created a messenger RNA. So they've created a messenger RNA, just like the virus itself is a messenger RNA. They have created the messenger RNA that when they infuse through a, through a vaccine into our cells, our cells are going to directly produce spike proteins. <laughs> that is so beautiful, just like Oxford as well. So these spike proteins, when they will be presented, macrophages are going to come in and say, what the heck is this? And they're going to start making the immune system active against the spike proteins. So if, even if in future the actual coronavirus comes in, we'll attack it. So Moderna is doing this. Messenger RNA is injected. FDA has already approved them in the U.S. for phase two. So they are now beyond phase one. And they are they're thinking that in summer, which we are almost there, are we in summer? They would be working with uh, phase three. So they are very rapidly moving for forward. U.S. government has given them $483 million as well to continue their research and work. And they have raised funds from others as well. So there is a decent chunk of money with them. So they are they are they have deep pockets at this time and they are making the vaccine. So I'm actually very much confident that out of all of these, the Oxford or Moderna or Pfizer or, or Sinovac from China, one of them is going to come up with something within a month or two and say, hey, we are ready. Uh, although we do not know long-term efficacy, we do not know the right safety profile, but we also know that this does not let the virus come in. So at least some people can start using it. So moving on to the next one, Pfizer. So Pfizer is working with a German company, Bion BioNTech, and they are already... So what they did was these two companies, instead of making one vaccine, they are making four vaccine candidates. So they're making four vaccines. And some of those vaccines are messenger RNA-based vaccines. Some are uh, antigen-based, just like we just saw that the you send the spike protein as an antigen, a piece of the virus, dead piece of the virus. So they have a mixture of a com a combination of these methodologies, and they have four vaccines in the go right now. So some of these vaccines are already in phase one, and some are in phase two. They are in the U.S. right now and rolling 360 healthy individuals, which uh, once they think that they are done, they are happy, then they are ready to make 20 million doses in 2020. Now, just to for their credentials, they make 1.5 billion units of IV drugs, vaccines or drugs every year. So they do have a scale. For the other companies, for example, Oxford is going to work with uh, companies in uh, India and Europe to scale up. The problem is that if we have a vaccine today, how do we scale that vaccine? How do we make it in billions to give it to everyone? So um, Pfizer does have a, be a benefit here that they're already used to making billions of uh, units every year. So hopefully they can scale faster but they are saying that 20 million units can be made in 2020 as soon as their trials are, are done and they are approved. So that is Pfizer. Next is the last one for today is Sinovac from China. What they have done is they are, uh, they are in phase one and phase two, and they are asking for phase three for those areas where virus is rapidly expanding. So I believe that some of the uh, countries they are asking them to start using the uh, the vaccine. So they have requested WHO and they have requested various uh, countries, uh, health departments to say, can we come in and start using it as phase three? Their approach is traditional, chemically inactivated or weakened virus. So this is a common thing that you take the virus. So let's say this is a little test tube. You take the virus and put it in there. 
then you put some sort of a chemical that kind of burns that virus a little bit and makes it inactivated, maybe breaks its membranes a little bit. So the remaining broken pieces of the virus are picked up and they become the vaccine. So they have that traditional chemically inactivated virus. They were also, they also have a leg up. They also have a, uh, um, they are ahead because they were working on the vaccine for SARS. And the SARS, while they were working on that vaccine in 2003, the SARS pandemic was contained. And so their vaccine was not needed. I still cannot understand that how SARS was easily contained and it went away. And um, I had shared a study in the past that SARS immunity, the immunity that we develop against SARS stays for three years. Hopefully we would develop immunity that stays for at least three years against SARS-CoV-2 as well. But somehow SARS-CoV-2 has learned to be more contagious and more um, um, hardy to continue to spread like this. So they were working on SARS and then SARS pandemic went, uh, not pandemic, outbreak went away. And so they stopped working. And as soon as the SARS-CoV-2 came in, they were already ready with lots of uh, data collection and project plan. So they started working on it. They have already, so Kevin, to your point, they have already tested it on rhesus macaque monkeys and tested it successfully. So they have this test already under their belt. So this is the discussion. Again, if I just very quickly show you, I think that within next month or so, we would start listening from these companies to say, hey guys, we are ready to move forward. So this is the discussion for today. Um, I also did one more thing. <laughs> so Tortillero, uh, did you like the, <laughs> the, the word adult that I spoke? So um, I did a video today, which is six minutes video about vitamin D3 and it is a more of an infomercial than this kind of a discussion. So can you do me a favor and watch that video and give me comments, uh, give me your feedback that is that a decent way? Should we make more of such videos as well or not? So with this, thank you very much. Stay safe. Tell me what would you like to discuss tomorrow? I think we should talk more about things that how do we get out and back in the society and how do we protect ourselves and how do we work? But I am open to your suggestions. For example, somebody had talked about blood groups and race as the um, as the prevalence and uh, you know targets of this virus. So if you like, we can talk about the blood groups and various ethnicities and their response to the virus. If you like some other uh, concept, please just put that up and we would do that. So how is it working together and studying together? I feel very cozy that this is a little um, cool beans group and we study and discuss things together and we continue to become smarter. I feel that we protect ourselves from rumors and from misinformation by getting ready and understanding these things in depth. So if you are comfortable with this, please tell me and also share these uh, videos as well it helps me uh, continue to produce more content. And I have never tried to sell my content here. You are all a witness of that. I've never ever tried to say, go buy something from me. So this is, this is the only help. Like it, subscribe it. Uh, talk to you tomorrow. Please put your comments for what would you like to see the discussion about tomorrow. Bye-bye. Stay safe.